Hi, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to play a video while I go. Uh, it's a, just a cue behind you, just like music, that will help alter your perception subtly, because part of what my talk about today is altering perception. So who here has heard of Ignaz Semmelweis? Ignaz Semmelweis was a 19th century doctor known as the savior of mothers. Why? Because he pioneered a simple practice, the washing of hands between surgeries, and in doing so, reduced maternal mortality in the clinic almost 20-fold, from two out of 10 to one out of 100. Seems obvious to us now, right? That surgeons should wash their hands in between surgery. But here's the rub. This was 1840. And germ theory wasn't popularized until 20 years later with Louis Pasteur. Dr. Semmelweis knew his procedure worked. He had the evidence, but he could not prove the why. And in the 1840s, doctors believed in the theory of humors and that illness was a result of these humors being out of balance. So his research was categorically rejected because it didn't fit in the current model of disease, which was that illness happens outside of the body. Even his peers, even his wife, thought that he was crazy and had him committed to a mental asylum where he and his ideas were buried. Imagine how many lives could have been saved if this idea had been accepted sooner, if his peers had looked at the empirical promise of what he was doing instead of the theoretical dissonance that it created. 20 years of 20-fold more deaths because the idea was simply too radical. With respect to the brain and mental health, I believe we are currently in a very similar situation. Someone once told me a joke. What's the difference between psychiatrists and the patients at a mental hospital? The patients are the ones that eventually get better and go home. <laughs> but that's not entirely true now anymore, is it? More people are going home, but very few are getting better. In fact, mental health and substance use are the leading causes of disability worldwide. 350 million people are estimated to suffer from depression. Almost a million per year commit suicide. And between 2011 and 2050, the cumulative global economic output associated with mental health is projected to be $16 trillion, approximately the same amount as the entire US GDP. In fact, in this room, it is statistically probable that one in 10 of you are on an antidepressant, and that one out of four of you will suffer from a mental illness at some point in their lives. As the writer Rita Mae Brown once said, take a look at three of your friends. If they're OK, it's you. <laughs> but seriously, think about this. Everyone in this room is in some way affected by mental health or brain health issues, themselves or via a loved one. Every year, 15 million people suffer a stroke, of which 6 million die, and 5 million are left permanently disabled. It is the second leading cause of death. And dementia is skyrocketing. There were an estimated 47 million people living with dementia in 2015, and this number is expected to double every 20 years, reaching 75 million in 2030 and 130 million in 2050. To give you some perspective on that figure, that is more people than in all of Japan. And addiction is on the rise, too. 80% of the global opiate supply is consumed in the US, where painkillers are a $24 billion market. What are the two of the top three highest consumed drugs? Painkillers and antidepressants. Prescription opiate sales and overdose deaths are up 400% in the last 10 years, with a prevalence two to three times greater in veterans. One in four vets suffer from PTSD, and in the US alone, 20 vets, 22 vets per day commit suicide. And on average, one in three women will be the victim of sexual assault. We are talking one every two minutes, or seven by the time my talk is over. 13% of these rape victims attempt suicide, and many of them are left with PTSD. 
and among many of the refugee populations and victims of war, they recently had to coin a new term to describe the severity of the mental distress experienced because they felt PTSD did not appropriately describe the brain's reaction to seeing parents killed, homes destroyed, and streets strewn with bodies. The brain is a fragile thing, and I should know. You see, what started me on this journey was personal. First, someone I loved had an accident, a brain injury that left him partially paralyzed. It is not easy to see someone suffer. I read everything, I researched everything, I talked to specialists, but science offered no solutions. And then something happened to me. I was the victim of a violent crime, a kidnapping, and could not recover. I could, simply couldn't seem to get back to the way I had been before. I had, due to tra one tragic twist of fate, become temporarily mentally ill. There's a joke in mental health circles. Uh, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but it takes nine visits. <laughs> how many psychologists, oh, sorry, well, nine visits didn't cut it for me, nor did any of the various psychiatric medications that they tried to put me on. I needed to find another solution. My life, quite frankly, depended on it. So I started to think, what is mental health? And who is mentally healthy? In a nutshell, mental health is the absence of mental illness, just as being healthy is the opposite of being sick. But in physical health, you can be injured, you can be healing. There aren't really words like that in mental health. Because in many cases, things like brain injuries, addiction, PTSD, these are things you rarely recover from. You can treat, perhaps, and minimize the dysfunction, but the idea of actually healing, that is a word we just don't use. But it is time we changed that mindset. So today I would like to introduce a new word, mental injury. By calling mental distress mental illness, we imply that these people are broken. But, but mental injury carries within it the seed of hope. I hope that we will get the tools that do work to the people that need them. I think the field of brain health is suffering from what I call blind spots. Let me explain. The author and neuroscientist Oliver Sacks wrote a story about a woman in her 60s called Mrs. S. She had suffered a stroke that left her unable to look left, turn left, or even see anything in her left field of vision. So for example, she would complain that she wanted more food when half her plate, the left half, was still there, untouched. Or if you asked her to look at something on the left side, she would turn all the way around to the right to see it. 50% of the world simply didn't exist to her. Her mind protected her from what she did not know by pretending to know. She had what I call blind spots, and science does too. Just think about it. Wasn't it just 30 years ago that we thought dietary fat was bad? And this idea persisted as issues like heart disease, diabetes, and obesity rose to epidemic levels. Great ideas can spread, but so too sometimes can bad ideas hang around so long that you, have, you forget you have the option of questioning them. Last year, the Journal of the American Medical Association produced a paper in which one of the authors said, and I quote, placing limits on fat intake has no basis in science. No basis in science. What else have we believed that has no basis in science? Most people, when they think of mental health and the tools that the psychiatric industry has made available, think of SSRIs, ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, benzodiazepines like Valium, or neuroleptics like Seroquel. These compounds all work to change the chemistry of the brain to make certain neurotransmitters more or less available. This is meant to treat the imbalance in the brain. Does the word imbalance sound familiar to anyone? Like, a little bit like humors? Um, for the last 50 years, along with psychology, these have been the tools we used. But while these drugs all work on changing the levels of neurotransmitters, none of them can impact neuroplasticity or the expanded version of that, something I call neural rerouting. 
In a nutshell, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections. Much like toning and bulking a muscle, the more a pathway is used, the stronger and more responsive it gets. That is why we practice things. So they become almost automatic. Because neurons that fire together, wire together. Sounds great. But actually, this is not always a good thing because it also means that we can get stuck. For example, I took singing lessons most of my childhood, but stopped 20 years ago. And to this day, I can still sing. This is because I spent years practicing to build those pathways. And while this is helpful in, say, karaoke, what if instead I had spent years injecting heroin, or hiding from an abusive parent, or taking cover every time a bomb went off? How did these neural pathways help me then? They don't. Because these pathways can be adaptive, good, or maladaptive, bad. And it is hard to change or reroute these neural pathways once they have been, become hardwired. For, for example, if you're right-handed, handed, just try tonight to brush your teeth with your left hand, and you will see what I mean. In addiction and PTSD, these neural pathways are literally hijacked. It isn't just habit, which in itself is hard to break. It is a highly rewarded activity or developmentally primal activity that gets quickly reinforced. So does correcting the balance of neurotransmitters help this? Not at all. And while medication and ex exercise can both help with neuroplasticity, the neural routing, the patterns of the wiring itself is immensely difficult to change. Plus, I mean, imagine telling someone with dementia to meditate, or a stroke victim that is, too paralyzed, that is partially paralyzed to exercise, or suggesting to someone so depressed they haven't left the house or showered in days that they should start hitting the gym more. These are all mental injuries, maladaptations. In these cases, psychiatric medications are like giving someone with a broken leg a painkiller without fixing the injury. Is it any wonder that people don't get better? or that mental health has become such a systemic problem. But there are tools that show great promise. The only issue, they don't fit with our model. I'm talking about an area of study that is largely untapped, psychedelic science. And it is a science, believe it or not, although it has gotten a bad reputation from misuse. Psychedelics are powerful drugs and under controlled settings far less dangerous than many of the drugs currently out there, like opiates. Technically, psychedelics are anything that alters perception. And while the idea of promoting something that can cause hallucinations to someone who is mentally injured sounds absurd, the problem with dismissing psychedelics is that they work. Why? Because they seem to be able to transform these hardwired neural patterns, rerouting them often in as little as one dose. One researcher likened it to, quote, a surgical intervention and, quote, the inverse of PTSD. Why? Because they seem to be able to transform these hardwired neural patterns, rerouting them, often in as little as one dose. In PTSD, which is what I had, one terrible experience can completely rewire how you see the world. With psychedelics, it is similar, but this time it is positive, with a single meaningful experience able to rewire the brain in a way that is transformational and enduring. Regarding psilocybin, better known as magic mushrooms, one researcher says it does in 30 seconds what antidepressants take three to four weeks to do. So far, psilocybin has been tested in depression and end-of-life anxiety, and the results have been incredible. In one study, two doses of psilocybin lifted the depression of all participants three weeks and 40% for three months. Two doses. And these are people with severe treatment-resistant depression, meaning that all treatments, all other treatments had already failed. And on average, they had been depressed for 17 years. Another study on end-of-life anxiety and depression had similar results. 80% were significantly better and 60% were no longer clinically in the depression range. And on the addiction side, in a study on smoking cessation, 80% of subjects were still not smoking at six months follow-up. LSD is also showing amazing promise. In a study on subjects with anxiety associated with life-threatening illness, LSD-assisted psychotherapy was successful in almost 70% of subjects, 
results that were maintained over a year post-study. How are these results even possible? We don't totally know. I hypothesize that it's because it increases neuroplasticity and a sort of ne expanded neuroplasticity that I call neural rerouting. This is not mainstream and not universally accepted, partially because the field is quite siloed and partially because definitions of neuroplasticity tend to be quite narrow. Admittedly, there is a lot that we do not yet understand, hence why I had to make up a word to describe what was happening. But what we do know is that both psilocybin and LSD attach to serotonin receptors, specifically D2 receptors, but that they do so in a very different way than naturally occurring neurotransmitters, which is why they can produce halluc hallucinations, whereas serotonin cannot. The two compounds differ, though. Psilocybin, while increasing connectivity between the brain regions overall, appears to quiet one part of the brain, the default mode network, a system we associate with self-referential thought and thinking about ourselves. In depressed people, activity in this network goes way up. One theory is that depression is not necessarily a bad thing. It's your mind trying to solve a problem. But if it goes on too long, it can become hardwired. LSD also acts by binding to serotonin and in a way never seen before, literally wrapping itself around the receptor rather than just locking into place. This is why it lasts so long. But even more interestingly, LSD appears to increase the global connectivity of the brain, connecting regions that don't normally speak to each other and multiplying the amount of weak connections dramatically. So if you imagine the brain as a ball covered with rubber bands, a brain in normal use would have a few hundred, whereas the LSD one would have thousands, as various parts of the brain start communicating with each other in new ways over multiple, often lesser used pathways. This increase in weak connections, though not sufficiently studied, shows promise at helping victims with brain injuries because if one area is blocked, it is hypothesized it may be able to go around it, almost as if a big highway closed and Google Maps helped divert you to the side streets. And there are other drugs. MDMA in particular shows incredible promise. In one study on victims of sexual abuse who had PTSD, 83% who were given MDMA-assisted psychotherapy no longer met the cl clinical criteria for PTSD, and these results were maintained for several years. And here's some good news. MDMA for PTSD in veterans was recently given the green light to go into phase three trials. Now, let me be clear on this. I am not suggesting that people go out and try these drugs. Far from it. But I do think that the mentally injured should be given access in a clinical setting to anything that helps. With suicidal people and addicts, for example, it could be the difference between life and death. If made scalable, this could be something that could help heal the wounds of war and help prevent the kind of lasting damage one often sees after catastrophes. Right now, unless you are among the few, lucky few who get into a clinical trial, your only options are to find an unlicensed practitioner attempt to do it yourself using illegally acquired drugs, or travel to places where the compounds are legal, like I did. It has become the backyard abortion of our time, where people are willing to risk their lives in the hands of a recommended stranger, or travel to a foreign town where they know no one to access what they see as their last hope. Like Dr. Semmelweis did more than a century ago, we seem to have found something that works. Let's not let our own blind spots prevent us from letting people access something with the potential to save lives, merely because the why is not yet completely understood. I believe mental health is a human right. This research deserves to be explored further and at a rate commensurate with the urgent need. Currently, all the studies mentioned above are small, most less than 100 people and some as few as 12. This is not because the promise is not there but rather because the capacity to fund and the political will to allow access is not where it needs to be. To date, all of the major institutions funding psychedelic research are not for profit, a fact that limits the scope of study, number of subjects, as well as the potential to lobby. This needs to change. What is needed is a for-profit, world-positive organization that can help fund this research, as well as enable access to these life-saving medications. 
Every compound will require tens of millions of dollars minimum before it can be brought to market. And it is almost impossible to make that happen without being able to take the kinds of large investments needed to scale. Organizations such as the Beckley Foundation, MAPS, and Hefner have worked tirelessly for decades to keep this flame alive. And what we need now is a torch to light it. What we need now is a movement. My partner, Thomas Ermacora, and I started Evolutionary Ventures to address this need and to help address the systemic and political issues that plague this research. But to make it happen will require your help because to truly understand how these compounds work and get them to the people who need them, we need everyone to demand that they see the light of day. I am well today, literally healed, but I am one of the lucky ones. I had the means, both financial and logistical, to find a solution for myself. And I'm grateful every day for having been given the second chance on life. It is time to send the elevator back down because the people that need this most desperately can't afford to wait decades. Thank you.